Hey there internet friends, welcome to the first in a series of videos on colour calibration for retro gaming CRTs. There's a lot of videos out there on the internet talking about calibration for CRTs and they're quite excellent when it comes to things like geometry, convergence, linearity, alignment, our black and white levels of our luminance. But unfortunately a lot of them rely on calibrating CRT colour by eye. And that's fine to a certain degree, but this video will explore why there are very hard limits to how accurate that can get, and how even the trained eye can make a lot of mistakes, and what sort of tools we can use to make that process far more objective. Anyone familiar with the work of tools like the MD Fourier project for retro gaming audio will know how hardware and objective measurements can remove the subjectivity from audio analysis. And we'll look at the same sort of things for CRT colour in the coming videos. This video will start with colour theory. However, if you don't care about the theory, please feel free to skip this video as it is kind of long and boring. However, I'll do my best to cover the important terminology of colour theory, especially around calibration from a colour science point of view, so that we all have a common and accurate language. So who the hell am I? My name's Dan. Um, I've worked in the media industry and the VFX industry for quite some time. Uh, I'm a computer scientist by trade, but I've worked closely with color scientists um, and broadcast engineers and a whole group of people whose job it is to make sure that displays show the right color in an accurate way that conform to standards. Um, so hopefully I can share with you a little bit of my expertise here in these videos um, in, in a easy to understand way. Um, if you need to ask me any questions or uh, chat to me or complain about this video in any way, shape or form, um, you can get me on Twitter or on my main website, Stick Freaks, uh, where I also do some game preservation stuff which may or may not interest you. First up, a lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about in this video you can read up on Wikipedia, and I know a lot of people roll their eyes when they hear the Wikipedia word, but when it comes to industry standards uh, and science um, and the maths behind all of this sort of stuff, Wikipedia is a great resource for this. It's not something that's community researched. Um, a lot of this is, is science and standards that are ratified by different groups, and Wikipedia does a great job of documenting those. So I'll put some links uh, in the bottom of this video as we go. Um, and you can read those at any time. They're great uh, background information reading on all of this stuff. Worth, worth reading. So this video is going to be about colour science basics. And I do stress these are basics. Colour science, colour theory, the science of colour perception is an enormous field of research. It's continuing every day. A, a lot of the groundbreaking work that was done was done a century ago, but the the complexities, especially of how displays show information, are growing every day. So this video is aiming really to look at the absolute basics, the, the 101 stuff, um, and, and share with you more than anything terminology, so that when we look at how we calibrate displays later on, the terminology makes sense and we're all speaking the same language. So first up, a little bit of background biology. Um, your eyes. Inside your eyes are a number of cells. The two that we're really uh, interested in for the sake of this video are the rods and cones. Across the entire electromagnetic radiation spectrum, humans can only see a very small part of that spectrum, and we call this visible light. Some animals can see either side of the spectrum slightly, the honeybee, for instance, can see slightly into the UV spectrum. But for us, we're limited in what we can see. And we measure the wavelength of this light, of this electromagnetic radiation, in nanometers. And as humans, we can see roughly 380 or so nanometers, which we perceive as a, a very dark blue, all the way up to... 720 or so nanometers, which we see as a very bright red, and of course the whole rainbow in between. So 
So how do we perceive this light? Inside our eyes are rods and cones, cells that pick up different wavelengths of the light and send different signals to our brains. The rods themselves are responsible for light volume or luminance, the amount of light that we perceive. They in turn trigger our pupils to dilate if there's too much light or too little light to let in or hold back the light. And we need this because we need to see quite a, a wide range of light. The rods themselves are very sensitive to light in an interesting spectrum. Um, you'll notice here that they are most sensitive at this blue-green level and they start to drop off quite rapidly as we drift into yellow-red. And if you consider the evolutionary background of humans where during the day at the peak brightness most of the colours we see are in this blue-green spectrum. We do tend to see the blue sky, green trees, water, those sorts of things which are common around us which we perceive as very bright. As the sun sets and the light uh, diffracting through the Earth's atmosphere turns to red, we get less light. So the red light tends to not trigger the rods as much. This is the same reason that you'll often see red light in emergency lighting, and this is why you'll see red light in photography labs, uh, simply because low volumes of red light can still be used by our eyes to perceive detail, even though it's not triggering our rods to tell our brain that there's too much light. Cones, on the other hand, are stimulated by different wavelengths of light. And because we have three different types of cones, we refer to this as trichromatic vision. There are other animals, mammals, birds, reptiles, that have different types of vision. Um, I mentioned the honeybee before. Um, it has tetrachromatic vision, so it has a fourth type of cone that picks up a UV light range that we can't see. But in humans, these are mostly stimulated by the colour that we call blue in this range, the colour that we call green in this range, and the colour that we call red in this range. And our perception of other colours in this range, for example yellow, are a mix of red and green. So while you think you see yellow, you don't. You see different levels of red and green and your brain mixes this information to tell you that it's yellow. Similar to cyan, similar to magenta. Colours in the middle of the three primaries that we don't actually see. So this is quite an interesting phenomena, one that does take a little bit to get used to and to understand that a lot of what we perceive around us doesn't exist or, or does exist and, and we don't see it that way. And then later on we'll see how televisions in particular display this colour back to us in a way that is only really useful to us. So now the science comes in. Now that we have understood how the biology works, how do we map this? So this is a diagram you'll see a lot when we talk about colour calibration and colour perception. This is the CIE 1931 colour space, a mapping of all colours that human beings can see. What this mapping aims to do is to turn the 380-ish to 720-ish nanometer range into this curved outer shape around here. We then plot on an XY axis those colors and we can refer to these by coordinate. Now what is important to realize here is that this is a slice of a 3D object. You can imagine an axis coming out of the screen towards you measuring whiter, lighter colors, versions of all of what you see in front of you. Similarly an axis going back past the back of the screen that are darker versions of all those colors towards black. Now we measure those as luminance variations of these colors and we'll demonstrate that later on when we do calibration to show that. So this is a representation of the 
middle level of all of those colors. Once again, we can also see that there is no white light. We can see in the middle of this shape that a combination of the different spectrum that we see produces white light. Similar for our secondary colours, our magentas, our cyans and our yellows. Those colours don't exist, they're just an analogue merge of the different levels. So finding what white light is, defining white light and measuring white light is quite tricky. Um, and also due to the sensitivity of our eyes, it can be almost impossible to uh, measure simply by eye. So mapped over the top of our CIE 1931 diagram, we have these McAdam ellipses. What these ellipses represent are average human sensitivity to different light spectrum. So for example, if we took a, a colour here and we showed the average person a colour either side of that in this range, they'd likely tell us that it's the same colour versus if we gave them colours in this range and this range, they'd likely tell us that they're different colours. So it becomes quite difficult for humans to colour match by eye due to these phenomena. So you'll notice our colour resolution is quite poor in certain areas. Our green resolution especially, very poor. Theories for this are, evolutionarily speaking, green represents the colours of foliage, trees, plants, things that aren't of great concern to humans versus other colors that could represent food or danger in nature. So we have higher resolution for those colors. Looking at a, a more modern era, reasons why we choose certain ink colors when we print and write. So we tend to prefer blue ink or black ink for writing versus green ink, which is quite difficult for us to make out because of this exact phenomena. Similarly, because our green resolution is so poor, often it's the choice for why manufacturers will insert other signals inside our green signals. Anyone familiar with sync on green, for example, will often ask why sync is put on green and not blue or red. And the reason for that is quite simple. Interference in the green channel is less likely to be noticed by human eyes. If you put that same signal on a red or blue channel, we would see that as video noise very clearly. Of interest in particular to us is this area here of what we call white light, which of course, because of our trichromatic vision, is actually three different colours merged together. And this lack of accuracy across white light, knowing that we have our primaries of red, green and blue, our secondaries of yellow, cyan and magenta, white is a tertiary colour, has three influences in it. So given that white light doesn't exist, how do we define the colour that we call white light? So we measure white light in temperature. We give them these Kelvin values. Up the top of this list here we can see what we call warmer values even though the temperature is actually a lower number but we call them warm because of their redder tones. So candles and sunsets tend to sit in the 2000 Kelvin range. And as the Kelvin rating goes higher, we actually call these cooler lights because they head towards a blue color. So daylight, for example, in the Northern Hemisphere around the New York latitude, tends to be around 6500 Kelvin at midday. we use this value, the 6500 Kelvin value, as our reference white light. And you'll see this when we do more of the calibration later on. As you get into bluer lights, so past 6500 into the 7000 to 9000 Kelvin range, these values tend to be what a lot of televisions ship with as a default. Now, the reason for this is if you remember back to our rods and cones graph, blue and green light stimulate brightness. They give us a sensation of higher saturation or higher brightness levels. 
So setting a television screen to be too blue or too cool is often a way that TV manufacturers will give a sense of a screen being a brighter or more vivid screen. Unfortunately, it means that all the colours are off for that screen. It means that across the entire spectrum, everything will have a blue tint to it. So the colours that you see will be largely incorrect. It makes it very necessary to try and have to calibrate displays or set them into different modes other than what the showroom floor set those TVs to. Likewise, if we get used to our LCD and OLED screens and their high blue levels, it does impact on how we see our retro gaming CRTs as well. So another representation here of the temperature scale. Remembering that 6500 Kelvin, or around here, is where our white point needs to be set when we're trying to calibrate our displays. And that if we move up into these ranges, everything gets tinted blue across the entire spectrum. Another feature you'll hear of screen calibration is gamma. So let's talk a little bit about gamma. So often people will talk about gamma curves. And again, I stress that this is an introduction video. It's very basic. There are some great videos out there on YouTube, which I'll try and link to below that explain gamma better than this. But the idea is that we have this graph and across the horizontal axis, we have brightness. Across the vertical axis, we have our perceived brightness. So as the brightness goes up, we perceive more brightness. That seems logical. The only thing is, with humans, it's not linear. So one interesting function of human vision is that our brightness or our luminance perception is non-linear. Now what does that mean? If we see twice the amount of light, we don't perceive it as twice the amount of light. Now the reason for that is quite simple. Again, in nature, we don't want rapid light changes to dramatically hurt us or dramatically flood our vision with too much light. So our response to light changes on a curve. So this graph represents brightness versus how humans perceive brightness. We can see here at a brightness level of about 50%, humans actually only see a perceived 25% brightness. What we want to see, obviously, is 50% brightness. We want to see that accurately represented. So what do we have to do to an image in order for us to see this, even though we're actually seeing this? We have to use the inverse of this graph to correct the image. So in order for us to see 50% in this ideal dotted line, we actually have to send 75% brightness in order for it to correct from what is perceived. Now that's kind of a bit complex, but here's a visual representation. So let's scale this down into a pixel perfect grid. One black pixel, one white pixel next to each other in a grid. We'll put this on the left hand side of the screen so that 50% of the light is coming through. So here we have it. On the left, our grid, one black pixel, one white pixel. On the right, we have a 50% grey image. That is an image that's made up of the RGB primaries, red, green and blue. And each of those is set to half luminance on a scale of 0 to 255. We've chosen 127, which is quite close to center. However, we see something interesting. We see that the image on the left, despite being half brightness, doesn't look like the image on the right. There's a clear brightness difference between these two images. We perceive less brightness. Now here we have a brightness at roughly 74% at RGB 188. This should be much brighter, but it looks exactly the same as our half light. What's happening here is that our brains are perceiving 50% light as a different value. This is based on the gamma 2-2 curve, so it will depend on how your monitor that you're viewing this video is calibrated. 
this is the gamma 2.4 calibration. So if your monitor has got a gamma of 2.4, these two images will look very similar. However, either way, both of these are far more similar than the actual 50% grey value. So what did we see there? Initially, we had our 50-50 black and white checkerboard. And when we compared it to an image that was actually 50% on the RGB and grayscale, we perceived it as a lot darker. So then we corrected the image. We sent an image that was closer to 74 or 75%. And we actually perceived that as our 50% mark. So this is what gamma is. We measure the gamma of our displays and we apply a corrective curve that is the inverse of that. This is very important for us to get our brightness levels correct in our images and we'll see that in our calibrations later on. So up until now we've been talking about this uh, CIE 1931 horseshoe shape that represents all of the colours that human beings can see. We have a problem though with manufacturing of real world devices in that they can't actually project out all of these colours. They're quite limited in what they can show us. So in order to compensate for this, these devices have come up with this concept of standard gamuts. Now a gamut is a range of colours, a limited range of colours, that a device can show. So let's take a look at some of these common gamuts. So here we have our horseshoe shape that we're familiar with and within it a triangle. That triangle is a limited gamut of colours that a particular type of display can show. This particular triangle represents roughly three different gamuts that we're going to look at in detail when we calibrate our displays later on. These are standard dynamic range gamuts that we're used to. Uh, they're all very similar. Um, the difference is the exact XY coordinate of these, what we call primaries, these red, green and blue points, are slightly different. Those three gamuts are REC 601, REC 709 and sRGB. They all use this 6500 Kelvin or what we call D65 standard white point, which is good. It means we can... Uh, calibrate to that and cover a wide range of gamuts, but the primaries differ ever so slightly for standard definition television in the broadcast era. So when you're talking your uh, 240p 480i type era uh, for NTSC displays, your 288p 576i type era for PAL displays, um, and then computer displays of the uh, earlier era typically VGA monitors. So strictly speaking, we should be calibrating for REC 601 when we calibrate. REC 709 is the standard definition range color space for high definition television. It's very similar to the uh, REC 601, slight difference in primaries, um, but tends to be a little bit more easier to get content to calibrate to. So we'll, we'll talk about that a lot more when we actually do the calibration. But just to compare for now, this is our REC 601, REC 709 gamut. There are other gamuts. So this is the uh, DCI P3 gamut, which is pretty popular in cinema or was for a while. Um, it was a wider gamut designed to uh, show more colors and more detail uh, when watching movies on, on cinemas that could display it. And this is the new REC 2020 gamut. Uh, that's the gamut that UHD TVs are supposed to conform to. Um, you can see that they, they show a lot uh, wider range of colors, which is, is great for upcoming TV standards. And uh, film will go further than this as well into the ACES standards, which are, are much wider than this. Um, but we're getting pretty close to the full human range in some of these newer gamuts, which is great. There's also some other ones, uh, some matte paper gamuts and some pro photo gamuts. These wider gamuts are 
usually develop for whatever industry is interested in them, whether they're print industries or film industries. But you can see all these different gammas, gamuts tend to center around this D65 white point. But for our needs, Rec 601, Rec 709, they're the standards we're going to look at when we calibrate. So you'll see this triangle gamut inside our horseshoe range. Um, and you'll be quite familiar with that by the time we finish calibrating displays. So now let's take a look at a video display. In particular, let's take a look at a, a CRT monitor. How do they display the colours that we see and we perceive? What does it look like from an electronics point of view? So a quick reminder of our rods and cones. We see these primary red, green and blue colours. We perceive brightness. So this is what's happening in our brain. This is how our eyes are seeing things. How does the video monitor display that to our eyes? Here's a familiar little guy. We're probably all uh, very aware of who this fella is. And the colours we see in this image, we've got some greens up here, some sort of pinky magentas here, uh, some whites of the eyes and some nice skin tones. What do they actually look like? This is some macro photography I've taken straight off my Sony PVM monitor. 240p image coming out of a real Super Nintendo. Let's take a closer look. As we zoom in, we, we really do start to see something very interesting. Those solid colours don't appear so solid. We see these lines of uh, vertical lines of information. Let's zoom in a bit more. Here we can really start to see these colours broken up. Inside our CRT, we have three guns. The guns shoot ion beams at the screen and they trigger different colour phosphors. No surprises, we've chosen red, green and blue guns to generate pictures. Those pictures have colour information that are encoded to standards that match how our eyes react. Let's zoom in a little bit more. A closer look at this white information here, we can clearly see that the white is actually made up of several colors, red, green, and blue. And the levels of these red, green, and blue brightnesses and intensities are what tell our eyes that the color is. Same over here for our uh, skin tones. Mixing of red and green to come up with those tones. We can see that across the whole image. This image here is uh, the light that a fluorescent light spits out. Now you might be wondering why sitting under a fluorescent light your eyes hurt after a while. Why well, it's such a terrible light source to read under. What we see here is the intensity of the light coming out of the fluorescent light. This is a, a standard cheap fluorescent lighting system. We notice it's uh, quite spiky, the graph above the light. And uh, when we talk about the, the types of colors that come out of lights, we talk about them sometimes as spiky lights. And what we're referring to is the fact that there are limited amounts, this quite a bit of this blue here, some blue here, a lot of green, remembering again that our perception of brightness really comes from this green. Um, some of the yellow spectrum, but a huge amount of red. Now, of course, you can imagine if this is hitting paper or any sort of material that you're trying to read off, you're getting a very limited spectrum coming back at your eyes. So while you perceive a certain amount of brightness, you're actually not seeing the full spectrum of light. And even though your brain thinks it's white light, and even though your brain thinks the scene in front of you is quite evenly illuminated, you get quite a terrible sense of, of brightness and contrast coming back into your eyes. And that's why fluorescent lighting is, is quite a terrible lighting system to read under compared to full daylight, which gives us the full spectrum in much more even amounts across this value. So here we have our secondary colours, uh, as well as our tertiary colour. So going over what we've learnt so far, we know that the display that you're probably watching this on, and the display certainly that I'm watching this on now as I look through this, doesn't have these colours. It doesn't have cyan, yellow, magenta. It certainly doesn't have white. It does have groups of three RGB, red, green, blue, that display at certain combinations and certain intensities and fool our eyes into thinking that they're seeing those colours. So the next time you're uh, playing a game or watching television, 
consider the colours in front of you, consider the display you're watching, and consider that those colours don't exist. They're sending triplets of red, green, and blue, different intensities, and you're perceiving them as different colours. Think about all the colour science behind that and how they measure those intensities, and, and that's what we're going to try and calibrate our displays to, to see if we can match the exact standards that the people who made these games were using when they were developing the game. Now some more trickery around colour and why it's so hard to calibrate by eye. We're probably all very used to seeing the 240p test suite at this stage, but unfortunately there's some trickiness that goes on inside your brain and it can lead to inaccuracies when you try and calibrate these displays by eye. Take for example these two pictures. If we stare at them, we kind of assume that there's some bluish green in the images, that these are just sort of sepia tone images. But in fact, both of these images have been made so that there is absolutely no blue or green in them whatsoever. These are purely shades of grey or red, nothing else. The image on the bottom is quite interesting in that if we zoom right into the pixel level, we see something totally different, in which every second line is actually a red horizontal stripe. Our brain can't see these at certain distances and certain resolutions, so trying to judge these colours is almost impossible. Take a look at this fine fellow for holding up five pieces of paper. And we can probably see that the image is a little bit too blue-green, even without any sort of sophisticated equipment. Let's try and change the filter on this a little bit so that it's a slightly different colour. We've gone too far here, obviously into the pink-red area. But take a look in particular at this second folder. In both images, the second folder is exactly the same colour. If you were to take a colour picker tool in something like Photoshop and measure that colour, it would be exactly the same. The problem is it's almost impossible for our eyes to see that because we are totally influenced by colours around any given colour. It makes it really hard to judge the exactness of a particular colour by eye. Shades aren't easy to see either. Here we have sections A and sections B. And again, if we took a colour picker and examined this part of the colour and this part of the colour, they're exactly the same colour. But our brain is telling us that it can't be the same colour. This part's in shade and this part's in light and we adjust. But again, take a colour picker tool, pick these colours out and they'll be exactly the same. All of these images are available on Wikipedia under the colour constancy page. I'll link to those below. You can try these for yourself. So how do we judge colour accuracy? If our eyes are quite poor at doing it, how do we get it right? Well, thankfully we have the technology. Unfortunately, sometimes that technology can be quite expensive. Here's the Klein Instruments K10A colorimeter, state-of-the-art colorimeter. Unfortunately, it retails at around about $6,900 US dollars. It's a little bit expensive for uh, our tastes. Slightly cheaper, but still in the uh, ridiculous price range, we have the Spectrical C6. In this image, we have the colorimeter here, a device that will attach to a TV and measure the colors accurately. And we have the VideoForge Pro, a device that will generate test pattern colors that are, meet an exact standard so that you can measure them accurately. Unfortunately, the probe starts at around $795, and the Complete kit at around $2,395. Still quite too expensive for our taste. We also, likewise, we have software test pattern generators and software measurement tools. All of these are professional grade color calibration tools, color calibration measurement suites, and color calibration test pattern generators for PCs. Again, the prices here are pretty crazy. 
same with our hardware, test pattern generator hardware. Not exactly the sorts of dollars that we want to throw on devices that we're only going to use once in a while. Now we're getting somewhere. This is the X-Rite i1 Display Pro and you'll notice this form factor of this device is the same as the Spectracal we saw earlier. It's a slightly lower end device, it's got different firmware on it, but the accuracy is quite excellent. We're starting to get to a price now that's pretty reasonable. This one's popular with photographers, the Spider X by Datacolor, uh, continuing on with their Spider series. They had the Spiders 1 through 4 prior to this, and now they've got the X model. Unfortunately, this model's going the way of uh, some newer calibrators where they've dropped CRT support due to the uh, refresh nature of CRTs. It only supports OLEDs and LCDs. It's a bit of a shame because it's quite a nice price. The accuracy on them isn't great, but for our intents and purposes, pretty good. Now we're getting somewhere. This is the Color Monkey display. It's the same form factor as the i1 Pro and the Spectracal C6, and you can find them on eBay for around about 100 bucks. I've got one of these myself, and this is the device I'll be using when I calibrate a lot of displays in later videos. Pretty happy with the price at 100 bucks. And some software. The AVS HD software comes for free. You can get it from the AVS AVS HD forums. Luckily it supports a number of tools including Calman, Chroma Pure and Color HCFR and I'll talk about this one a little bit more in a second. Here we see the BT709 or the Rec709 standard that we spoke about before in our different gamuts. Now we did mention that Rec601 technically is the correct gamut for calibrating our retro CRTs to era accurate display technology but again Rec709 is extremely close and Devices like these, um, bits of software like these that calibrate to Rec. 709, which is popular in the uh, HDTV market, are very easy for us to get our hands on. So uh, calibrating to Rec. 709 can sometimes be a little bit easier than 601. This is what the AVS HD images look like. They give us a nice black window uh, with a calibrated color inside. We can then attach the colorimeter or the probe to our display, measure these colors, and then adjust the display to meet what we expect these colors to be versus what is actually being shown. This is the HCFR software. It's uh, free from the HCFR forums, which is my favorite price. Unfortunately, this software only comes for Windows. Um, I prefer a Linux native version, which apparently is being worked on, but we've got this for now, which is great. You'll notice here the horseshoe shape that we're familiar with, the triangle gamut within that horseshoe shape. This device here is measuring one of my displays. The squares represent the desired value, the circles represent the measured values. And we can see here I'm doing what's called a uh, gray sweep, so going from 0 gray to 100 gray in steps of 10, measuring them and getting this what we call delta E, this difference that we want, um, and measuring that. So this is after calibration with all my delta E's in the green range, which is quite good. So don't worry too much about this terminology for now. We'll get more into that when we actually do the calibration. But now you can start to see why all this information matters, why we care about this kind of stuff. And the probes and tools that we'll use will be able to tell us this information very accurately when we do our calibrations. This is HCFR measuring our luminance response as well. Um, so we often talk about HDTVs in nits or candela per meter squared measurements of luminance. And we can use these tools to measure not only the accuracy of the red, green and blue channels as they map across the luminance spectrum, but also the brightness, the amount of light that these are spinning out to make sure that they are within standards that we want. Similarly, across our gamma curves, we can measure that the red, green, and blue channels all align at different gamma points, and that the gamma curve itself tracks in the way that we expect, so that we always have the correct luminance and gamma information seen in front of us. And finally, this is our sweep again, just across the grayscale. Post calibration, this isn't too bad. Normally, displays out of the box will have these wide swings all over this can be very high if it's over-luminant, it can be 
individual channels, such as the blue channel, shot up really high if you get TVs that come off the showroom floor. So we'll see that when we do our calibration. We'll do a before and after compare, and we'll see how bad some of these displays can be and how good we can get them, how close to spec we can get them. Once again, a zoom in of the CIA 1931 diagram with the REC 709 gamut inside that and all the measurements that I took on this display. This display is only a um, only has limited options for calibration, so we don't always get the uh, primaries where we want them. Our center point and our white are the, are the most important. Our gamma tracking across that quite important as well. Less important are these, but I'll show you as we go um, how that you can get these quite accurate when you do your calibrations. What bits matter, what bits don't. And a reminder that everything you've seen here is available on Wikipedia. I'll try and put as many links as I can uh, in the description for this video. There's a lot of reading there. You really don't have to understand it all in depth if you just want to calibrate the display, but it can really help. It can really give you a good picture of why these things matter, um, what they represent and the theory behind it. And once again, I, I do uh, really want to emphasize that this is really only scratching the surface of color science. Color science is a huge field of study um, and something that would take me a very long time to explain quite poorly, I feel, in a series of videos. So hopefully this is just uh, enough to uh, give you a taste for the size and scope of it and what we care about as gamers and dis users of displays. Once again, my name's Dan. Uh, if you want to catch me online, hit me up on Twitter or go visit my website. Uh, happy to take questions and complaints. Let me know what you think. Hopefully the next couple of videos will be a little bit less theory boring and a little bit more hands-on practical and we can all get to uh, making our video games look the best they can. Thanks for watching.